And, ah, okay, now it's better. So, ah, mute. Okay, so we will starting. Uh, we will have a, a conversation here about data protection in messaging apps. Uh, it's a specific topic uh, and a hot topic because we all around the world use messaging apps every day. Um, together with me, we have Joao Moreno Falcao from Brazil. He is working as a pen tester, a cybersecurity analyst in IntelliWay, a private company. We have Joshua Ashashi here uh, that is from the Youth Sustainability, Youth Alliance for Sustainability. Um, I am Nicolas Fiumarelli, uh, the LAC uh, board of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Here we have also our online moderator, Ose Imanu Kagia from the Ghana Youth ICF, and our other panelist, Savio, that is from the Federal Institute of Rio Grande do Norte State. We have a mix of technical and lawyers here, so we have a very good discussion. Um, well, I will read a, a very short description of the session and then we'll start with the speakers. So during the last decade, the world had a connectivity boost and one of the main impacted groups were the young individuals. For the first time in the history, we have a massive amount of children and teenagers exchanging messages across borders through the internet. Uh, the aim of this session is to have a youth-to-youth -youth conversation about the main policy issues of these nowadays current chat messaging platforms used by the majority of people, but specifically teenagers, for example, TikTok, WhatsApp, Instagram, Telegram, among others. So we will start the session with a series of questions for the panelists referring to this implication of the messaging apps usage in different contexts, uh, such as the impact on the privacy, related to the infrastructure of these messaging, uh, messaging app systems, and also we will address on how to ensure that the application of the declaration of the rights of the child uh, impact. Um, then at the end we'll, we'll have a, a discussion about law enforcement and other public policies, but also technical things, so we will address cryptography, encryption, and a lot of things um, in, in this uh, conversation. Um, well, so just to start, uh, ah yes, uh, I am presenting here Jose, uh, he will be our online moderator and we'll have some words uh, for you right now. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, everyone. My name is Jose Menukeja from Ghana and I'll be online moderator. Those joining online, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. As Nicolas already noted, this is going to be a highly interactive session, it's going to be a debate, it's not going to be a one-way talk. We all should be get involved. If you have a question, comment, you just raise your hand in all, you leave a comment in the chat session. And we hope for a fruitful conversation. It's such a raging topic, and we hope to advance this conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jose. So the first question to the panelists is, what are the main different ways or architectures that the applications deals with the content of chats? Uh, or what are the current challenges that we need to face? So maybe we can start with Savio. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your presence, even online or, or, or on site. Uh, well, uh, in the point of, uh, starting from the point of the two more, more common uh, messaging apps that are the WhatsApp and and the Telegram uh, applications. We have basically two manners to to communicate with our friends, our colleagues, which are uh, the mo the most common. At least uh, in in WhatsApp is the direct communication where my message goes directly to the to my peer. So uh, there is no way a sent centralization where the both of us are online and my message for Nicholas for example goes right to his phone no, not goes through one server uh, and telegram uh, has this this kind of communication but also uh, the most common in the case of of uh, telegram the messages are, are uh, stored uh, and, and 
how the communication goes through the cloud services, the cloud services of Telegram. So there are two different manners to to have this communication, and both of them have uh, uh, implications in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, considering, for example, if someone gets access to the cloud servers of Telegram, uh, or if he, he get access to your phone, we we will have different uh, kinds of uh, of access to private data and so on. But we we also have in the both cases and also in in other direct messaging. Uh, applications uh, in, in other platforms uh, as TikTok, as uh, uh, Instagram, as Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Uh, that is the metadata of the communication with the frequency of that, that you talk with your contacts, uh, the, the how much messages, what kind of messages is if it's test, audio, photos, video. Use. This is a kind of a qualitative analysis uh, of the communication that we have with your peers, with you, uh, with your peers, with your colleagues. So we can, in this way, understand how do you interact with your friends, and we have information about uh, who are your friends and how do you communicate with them. We can also infer things about you. So this is also important. Not only the content of the messages, but also the qualitative analysis of this metadata of, the, of this communication. I think that's it for now. Thank you, Savio. Very interesting. Maybe, Joao, you can address and explain for the audience maybe that don't know uh, about encryption on private keys so uh, and about the cybersecurity issues that uh, continue with Savio's comments. knows who you talked like five years ago at 1 p.m. and and you don't you don't remember it so uh, how can oh uh, it, it's hard for you yeah oh uh, okay yeah it wasn't online people wasn't here uh, so when we think about these uh, data that are now in servers, we need to first uh, protect this data at rest, and second, protect it, protect it during the tra uh, transmission of it. And well, the thing that protects the transmission are uh, cryptography that is sym symmetric. So it, and all of the, uh, the softwares that we use to uh, communicate uses uh, uses a computational uh, secure uh, cryptography. 
this means that if uh, the key is broken or the protocol is broken, we will have a problem. Because uh, if the computer uh, increases in the power processing, we will uh, face the this communication being widely open. So the what the thing that protects us in this uh, in this option, as in this case, is the desire of someone recording the messaging data uh, and storing for uh, long enough to this protocol be broken. And another thing too is uh, uh, on cybersecurity threats. Because, well, if someone uh, stole your phone or forces you to open it, uh, in a matter of minutes they will have access to all of your information and can download it and can, uh, can have this uh, access indefinitely. So we are with, uh, like, <laughs> putting all of our information in, uh, protected by one door, and if this door is open, it's over, because this information can be uh, copied and you will not have a control of that. We are seeing the implications of this uh, in a lot of spaces when uh, some uh, software or some platform is hacked and we have our uh, private information like our sensitive data and when it's leaked, it's leaked. You can do, uh, you cannot do much about it. So when we f look at these messaging apps, we face a massive uh, challenge because if this data is leaked, in case of apps that like store this data uh, in servers, we will really. <laughs> We will have a big problem. Very good. And then we'll continue about uh, what are the different policies around the globe regarding the regulation for data protection pur purposes? Is there any accountability issue regarding chat messages? And what about the, the children? Yes. Um, <coughs> sorry. And uh, l let me just say that. Uh, the air is quite thin in Ethiopia, so kindly forgive me if I, you know, take a, a deep breath every once in a while. And uh, but I'll start from the children. The Declaration of uh, the Children's Rights right, gives uh, protection to our children. But how does this translate into a hyper or an increasingly digital world? Let's take a look at these scenarios. Today, we have uh, children at homes who uh, prefer to talk to each other on social media, on instant messaging apps rather than face-to-face. -face. So the very definition of communication as we had in the past is being redefined by technology. And that gives us a, a lot of leverage, right? So whilst we are getting into new heights and it's exciting, the are serious challenges also in there uh, where someone can just triangulate you by the nearest uh, cell tower and then uh, using the messages that you post. Naturally, when we are speaking to people that we trust, there is a lot of us that we lay bare that the whole world doesn't see. And that is what gives us that danger. The fact that we are now secure in this instant messaging apps that once that door is open, it is laid bare. And so, for example, like I said, um, various global policies, and that leads to various country-specific policies around the world. For, for example, in Ghana, 2012, um, passed the uh, uh, Data Protection Act, 
that is supposed to guide um, the collection, uh, distribution, and uh, usage of data, and basically follows that kind of international protocol. Of course, you have the Global Digital Compact also that is meant to pave way digital rights, um, data protection laws, and. Of course, they are calling for submission. You can go to the UN website, um, uh, UN Digital Compact, to uh, make your submissions there. So all these are ways in which we can engage and ensure that our right to privacy is, is, is ensured. In fact, on my way uh, to, to, to the conference, for example, I, I wanted to, you know, after getting my ticket and everything, you know, first time at IGF, wanted to post. And then um, the friend I was traveling with was, no, turn the back of the ticket. Because apparently it happened to someone, the person posted the ticket online. And by the time the, she got to, 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 to checking, her flight had been canceled. And, and these are the kinds of dangers we face. So for someone who doesn't know about these dangers, how does this policies make sure that we educate them for them to understand the do's and don'ts of messaging or uh, laying ourselves bare, really? Thank you. So you mentioned about the, the policies, you mentioned about the possibility of education programs also for the end users to know uh, how the data is stored, how the data is communicated. But Savio, how is the privacy policy of this private sector or, or messaging apps? Uh, what, what, what this privacy policy say about uh, our messages uh, while, while they are not being delivered uh, because of the other phone is, is, is turned off? Uh, what, what happened with the data in all the scenarios as for the privacy policy? Uh, thanks for the question, Nicholas. Uh, well, uh, the first point, uh, getting a bit of uh, of what Joshua just said, is that uh, in terms of accountability, uh, there is one interesting point that I, I saw, for example, in, in the privacy policy of uh, TikTok, uh, that it, it even, uh, I'm not sure if you must uh, send your age uh, when you are uh, registering to, to the app, but it can infer your uh, your age uh, at least uh, in a approximate data like uh, between don't know between three and five years, between ten and twelve years. Uh, so this is one in interesting thing, and uh, this is there is also another concern uh, in regard to m the more, more specific only for messaging apps, uh, especially in the case of, of uh, WhatsApp, where uh, the, the data of WhatsApp can be uh, exchanged between WhatsApp and Telegram. So, oh, sorry, and, and Facebook, and, and all the other companies of, of uh, the Meta company. So basically, in WhatsApp, for example, if, if one, uh, you, we don't need uh, to to say our age, our birth data, and, and so on. But if we cross this, this data between platforms, we have information specific from WhatsApp from kids uh, that is being shared with other uh, with other platforms, and, and this is uh, in not the specific case. Of, of kids, but well, we have more information to be crossed, more inferences that can be done, and more things that can, uh, more uh, uh, things that can be done with child, with uh, teenagers, and so on, and also with youths. So maybe this uh, this is one point that we need more uh, transparency on how this data is being crossed, how what kind of information information is being used between the platforms. Uh, between Facebook and, and WhatsApp, for example. Uh, and well, I, in this case, uh, I don't see any problem uh, for for Telegram, for example, in case of the the, the aging, uh, youth, uh, uh, youth, child, teenagers. But well, uh, in terms of, of uh, storing messages, uh, there is no clear, clear information of for how much time the message keeps stored 
in the in, in the service of Telegram. Basically, they say that uh, it, it will be stored as far uh, as is important for you. So we can delete it, but uh, there is there is no auto deletion. For example, uh, it's not auto deleted. At least the text messages, but the media is sometimes deleted. Excuse me. Uh, and well, the, this is basically the point. And in, in in the case of WhatsApp, where all the communications are uh, peer to peer from phone to phone, uh, when one of the phones is is not connected, is offline, the messages goes to the to the WhatsApp cloud servers, and then it it keeps there until uh, the 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 peer is up again, is online again or for 30 days so this is this is basically the timing of the things in the general platforms very good uh, well also do we have questions in the zoom or raising hands yes currently um one question from bohan i don't know if as an online moderator i can also ask a question but we will also like to hear from you over here um, your perspectives on the various data protection uh, from your respective country. I'm quite interested in knowing from other jurisdictions how robust these laws are. And one question from Bohan is, my, he says, my question is, in the situations where enterprises dominate information storage and use rules, is there any way to promote use rights for information protection? I don't know who is taking this. Yes. Um, so in most countries, we've seen government come to the aid, and uh, that has worked so far in terms of government regulating and making sure that private enterprises do not abuse. But then, who protects us from the government? Because there is also that uh, conflict of interest, right? Um, for government to use anybody's data is just... Uh, for them to say um, a matter of national security. And is it really a, a matter of national security? So is it, so we, what the, the kind of dilemma we find ourselves in now is that on the one hand, government is able to make sure that the private entities do not abuse, but what if it gets to the point that government wants to abuse. So is it a case of coming up with a multi-stakeholder approach where you have equal representation from uh, private civil society, uh, private for-profit, government, end users, and you have them able to come together and uh, pass these policies and ensure its implementation. And I'll, I would also say that that's what, in fact, um, uh, Goal 16, Target uh, uh, 6 and 7 points to, right? That there should be that um, uh, representation when it comes to policy making and implementation to ensure that everyone's voice is heard and everyone's data or information is protected in the right way. Yes, go into a uh, room question. Yeah. Um, my name is Nikki Colasso. I, um, I work for Roblox. Um, I have a question about um, the, the panel is about sort of data protection for for youth. No one has mentioned age verification, sort of at a baseline. Who do we know? Who do we know is a youth? How do we even do age verification? Because um, to me, it seems like at a base level, most of the companies say that you have to be a certain age. Sometimes it's 13, which is arbitrary. I think that's somewhat U.S. centered. And in the rest of the world, it, it varies. And I think it, it's more broadly seen as 18. Um, but I think there's been a move from seeing as, from companies being the ones you know that, that should be doing verifying to now more thoughts on the side of the device and the operating systems being the ones that could potentially be a stronger 
um, player in the age verification space because I think, you know, if we are reliant on um, national forms of identity, for example, in the U.S., if we have to use um, driver's license or passport, we leave behind people who are undocumented or others who then don't get access to services. So I'm interested in the sort of at a baseline, we start the conversation, but we don't really talk about who is getting online and how are we even verifying who these kids are. And then on the data protection side, I think they're in the global north, there is a broader conversation about um, best interests of the child. So we've seen in the, in the UK, the age appropriate design code, we have the DSA coming in Europe. I think we've seen that picked up um, the U.S. is sort of a mess, but we see that a little bit in the U.S. I'll speak for myself. Um, we see that a little bit in the U.S., definitely in Australia, but how will we see those conversations, or how do you see those conversations evolving in the global south, or are they appropriate in the global south? How could we um, think about that in the global south? Because I, I do think they are, in many ways, the right conversations. Um, in terms of best interest of the child and really holding companies accountable for those data protection schemas. Um, and I'm interested in how they propagate further south. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, it's very, it was very enriching. And uh, yeah, this actually uh, really bugs me because. Uh, when we think like in Brazil about WhatsApp, it's like the main uh, messaging app uh, installed by the majority of people that which has a uh, cell phone. And what uh, this, even with kids, because well, their fathers use, uh, other kids use uh, their school group, and these people uh, end well, you are kind of forced to fake the uh, the ID to uh, to connect there, and in this sense, the company like uh, says, "Oh, okay, it's for uh, it's forbidden by us, so we doesn't need to look for it." And this is a huge problem, uh, and. Uh, there's uh, in my university. There's a group which uh, studies uh, the communication flux inside WhatsApp, and they are like uh, <laughs> they are uh, certain that this is very harmful. This dynamics very harmful for youth because uh, it's totally unattended. It's instant. You can hurt really fast and no one will notice it. If when we talk about the encryption end to end, in this sense it's like harmful to them. And we actually I don't know how to deal with this because uh in the same time we know that these kids uh need to be here because it's like the place that everybody is we also have the necessity of uh, guaranteeing uh, the uh, guaranteeing that all the uh, citizens will not be like uh, scanned and monitored in the name of the protection of kids. So it's very difficult to, to deal. So, um, for example, in, in Ghana, we have the Data Protection Act, which stipulates that you have the right to refuse to give your data out. Or you have the right to be forgotten. So they have your data, you can tell them, give me everything you have on me and delete it. The question is, how many banks, schools, institutions are willing to even abide by it is it a question of it is known by everyone so if you hit a, a snag or a challenge you go to the police and 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 tell them that this person refuses is refusing to give me my data it's even in whatsapp at the end of the day if you don't check that box 
you are not accessing the service. So it, it boils down to the kind of service that we provide, the take it or leave it service, and that is disheartening. Even before we get to the conversation of the children, the individual in the global south is not protected because most of the services, 90% that the average person can access is take it or leave it. So you are either giving us your data or you can't access it at all. You can't access our services at all. And that a conversation needs to, to go around that. For coming to uh, uh, children, largely in Ghana, aside from the policies that protect children, it largely uh, also depends on the family, right? To be able to say, okay, I'm buying this device for my ch uh, child, I'm putting parental control on it to see the sites that they visit to make sure that uh, they are protected when I am not with them. And it, it boils down to my earlier uh, submission. is a question of uh, education and how that education is given. Because if you pick an average person and you begin to speak technical language, it becomes difficult. And this is something that we've been advocating for a long time. How do we make sure that my grandmother, who is in the village, who I just bought a smartphone, that it is easier to communicate through WhatsApp than to, uh, to make a phone call? How do I make sure that she is protected? Or how do I get the information to her that these are the kind of pictures you can't take? Um, when you do this, this is what it means and all of these things. So it's a whole conversation that has to be had. It's quite complex in Africa, but uh, well, we are, getting, we are getting to that point where we're building, getting more Africans into the global policy space to make inputs and also make sure that at the local level, because for example in Ghana, you have the local assemblies who are responsible for implementing policies that the various ministries make. So how do we ensure that at the local level, implementation is done to its barest uh, maximum to achieve the higher impact? And that's what we're, we're, we're doing in Ghana at the moment. Thank you very much, Joshua. Um, so we come to our panelists. We have an insightful comments on the comment session. This one from Lenin, Nicholas Lenin from Ghana. He says, in data protection, government serves as a check on other stakeholders. But the task of keeping government in check can include the imposition of judicial oversight so that the use of exceptions such as law enforcement and national security are policed by judicial structures to avoid abuse. I, I, I kind of agree with him. Well, you come to that. And another one comment here, we will come to another question. He says that also, in this current form, I think um, he's answering the question is that in its current form, it is difficult to educate young people on most privacy schemes. I think I do agree, in, especially in Global South. We may have to redesign these privacy terms into much similar forms, perhaps using visualization and other means familiar to young people if we really want them to know about its impact. Couldn't agree more. So uh, I'll then pick a question from um, this one from Sarata Omane from also from Ghana. He says, in a number of apps, you are required to submit some data before you can install the apps. This is a global issue. How can we change the narrative such that if we don't agree to the policy, you can limit, you can limit the data you can send through and be able to install the app? And I'll pick the last round of questions, and I'll come to it. Our question, this one is from Bangladesh Remote Hub. They are watching live, and um, the question is, our question is that what is the impact on privacy related to the infrastructure of messaging app systems, and also how to ensure the application of the Declaration of the Rights of the Child? What will be the role of the youth experts in the field from technical and regulatory backgrounds? Interesting. I don't know who is taking this. You then come to the audience. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the question, and I will first address the question from, let me, I think that for, from Boha. But basically the, the, the question about how to 
do not uh, allow to collect my data and keep using the, the, the apps. So this is technically a problem because, uh, well, we, we, if we have a centralized system, it costs. So in somehow, and, and I'm not exactly de defending this, this, this part of, of the exploration of the information, but the, the companies that are hosting this kind of, uh, of systems has to pay the costs that is having one team to keep the app running to the, the servers, the cloud services, and so on. So this, is, this must be paid somehow. So in a, to have a kind of a definitive solution for this uh, would be something like the Web 3.0, uh, which is a decentralized infrastructure where we can maybe in somehow uh, have a low cost or zero cost, direct cost for one centralized in institution to host this kind of app. And also the other problem is to make this kind of, of platform popular. Instead of this, at least in my point of view, it, it's hard to have, to don't have any problem in, in this point of view. Because if this, the it is from a private company, it may have privacy issues. If it, it, it's uh, funded by, founded by some government, it may have some spying issue, uh, privacy issue, and so on. And well, uh, also, uh, co coming from from the civil society or something like that, it's still hard to to have uh, funding to to keep the things running. So, I think that uh, to have a kind of definitive solution for for this issue is in a future long future in a long run. Basically, we can have decentralized message apps. Thank you very much. Uh, insightful comments and I um, mean debates going on there in the chat, um, data extractivism and all that. We'll come to that. So we now go to the audience and pick some few questions. Um, I think someone raised their hand. Okay, I'm coming over. And we'd love to hear more from especially the global south and also more about that. Is anyone have a question? Hello everyone. I'm Milena, I'm from Brazil, and uh, I'm a fellow of Brazilian youth program. And looking at the youth civil society point of view, what is the paper of programs like IGF to increase the privacy policy knowledge around the world? And how this information can out from here and arrive from at uh, poor communities, for example? Let's take one part of question here. Okay. Your name. Uh, my name is Thais. I talk here representing uh, Alana Institute, a non-profit Brazilian civil society organization whose mission is to honor the children. Part of our work is related to the digital rights of children and adolescents and the commercial exploitation of their vulnerabilities. Well, I, I would like to understand um, and we're catching our view about and how to balance encryption and protection uh, children online and there is a place in the middle where we can guarantee data protection and privacy and at the same time combat abuse especially when it comes to apps that for uh, target children and talking uh, take advantage of the, the time I would like to convict everyone here to a panel that my organization is and it's embarrassing at Friday at uh, 11 and 15 it's, it's that right. thank you very much Okay, I, I think I would like to take the first question. Um, if I got your question right, how do we make sure that um, uh, what we discuss over here lives here um, to help those outside, right? Basically, if I got your question right. Okay, so um, one, one of the things I, I think we need to do more is to be deliberate about it and being deliberate about it means making sure 
that as civil society, we put it in an annual action plan, right? So um, I was just uh, yesterday speaking to the president of AGECFA, that uh, e-governance and internet governance foundation for Africa. They convened the Ghana School on Internet Governance, of which I was a fellow in 2021. Um, uh, how to make sure, because my organization operates in the Volta region of Ghana, uh, which is one of the 16 regions, and we're looking at how to bring a form of the internet governance to the Volta region, bring it closer to the people. Because most of the time, you, you have many of us traveling to the nation's capital to be part of programs like this, and, and then when we come back, how do the rest who are not able to travel access it? That will mean being deliberate about it and making sure that it's included in our action plans. And, and that is something we, we are willing to do. And if any of other organization is here and you are willing to support us in that way, um, human resource in terms of finance or uh, 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 just uh, helping us with communication and, and publicity, you are, you are welcome on board. Uh, I would like to address the second question about uh, the, the protection of, of child and, uh, and teenagers. So I think that in, in this point we have, I'm not, uh, first of all, I'm not a, uh, I do not have a uh, legal background, but just coming, uh, saying something that comes fr uh, through, my, through my mind, uh, is that we have regulation in, in other kinds of media, like TV and radio, that limits the kind of thing that, that goes through uh, to the, the the childs and and the teenagers, uh, and we we I really think that we we should have something in in this sense also for for the social media platforms uh, in terms of collection of data uh, because the our uh, current uh, approach on on regulating. Uh, the data protection is uh, I can uh, is asking to for us to can control the data that I send, but children do not exactly know the consequences of the data that is sharing, uh, so this is not uh, enough to for children to say okay do you know uh, uh, you can just uh, choose for not sending this data because they are not going to understand. So maybe one, some kind of, of uh, approach that could be taken uh, in this sense is having some kind of regulations that limit the kind of, uh, of data that it's collected, collected from child, from based basically in, in, in the age, and also uh, not only collection, but in some, in some platforms, uh, some data it can be harmful or, or, or can be badly used, but in some other context, the same information m might be uh, useful for for bad things. So maybe having some kind of, of of regulation also in terms of sharing information between platforms, still considering the age of the persons. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a comment from Lenin, and um, I think he was answering Bohan. It's a great question. These companies make their, mon their monies of data, we call it. I'm sure he's talking about big, da uh, big da uh, tech. Uh, changing that business model will require the introduction of alternate business models. For instance, if you don't want your data collected, you pay a subscription for the service. Without the alternative, private sector will resist any effort to limit data um, collection or extractivism. I don't know if anyone here agree with that. Uh, I would like to go to the audience and also um, I would like to know from individual perspective from the respective countries, w the policy regulation, my, forgive my ignorance, but my question is who is a youth? <laughs> I don't know who is a youth. So uh, I'll come to that. That's my question. So um, 
the audience if you have any input or questions here. So Ethan will have an input here. Ethan, here go. Um, thank you very much. I am Ethan Mudawanu. I am now an alumni of the ISOC IGF as Youth Ambassador. And I also work as a tech lawyer for Access Partnership. So mine is less of a question and more of a, call it an idea, if you will, that I hope you can filter out and develop. But with all this talk around um, children's rights and data, children's rights in terms of privacy and protecting it, um, and the idea of the children themselves not understanding what they consent to, whether they're playing on games or on TikTok, whatever the case is, the idea that the parents themselves also don't understand um, the implications of certain uh, you know, processes or giving data or even the value of giving the, the, the data that, that is required to be on these apps. There is now this notion which is um, growing more and more popular in, in law, in the legal space, where we have what we call comic contracts. Um, and essentially, it's, it's basic. It's pretty much um, drawings of what is happening, what are the legal obligations, what are the legal rights um, between um, the, the parties involved. And the heart of that is to make sure that the parties understand. So if it's a case of me um, being from whatever country I'm from and I don't understand English as well as the party that I'm contracting with, as we have these con comic contracts, there is some understanding of what we are, um, what we are agreeing to. So I'm trying to bring it all together in the sense of um, what, what is stopping us, one, or maybe how can we develop such or take from such ideas um, and develop from, from that to create an environment whereby the, the regulations or, or the consent uh, forms that whatever is filled in to access these apps can be presented in such a way that is digestible to the um, users. It doesn't necessarily, what I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily always have to be that traditional way of text that we are used to. Um, maybe there's a need for flexibility around that. Um, but yeah, that's essentially my comment and um, interested to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you very much, Ethan. Okay. Hello, thank you for this panel. I'm Julia, I'm here with the youth delegation from Brazil, and I'm also a master's student at the London School of Economics. I think I just wanted to add on his comment, um, because I feel like when we're discussing data protection and privacy of children online, um, generally we focus on um, literacy and consent, um, even the age-appropriate design um, from ICO sort of focused on that, on how to make um, information more easily understandable for children. But um, I have certain concerns that that is um, really effective because, of course, if children are going to be online, they need to have an understanding of what's going on, what are the consequences to a certain extent, understanding um, how they can, um, what are the consequences of using their data and so on. Um, but I feel like that's unfair to leave that burden to the children or even their parents because um, there is a lot of, um, it's an, an unbalanced relationship. So how can we go um, f to another direction? I don't have an answer to this question. It's a, it's a question that uh, keeps coming back to me all the time. But how can we have a different approach that does not focus on consent or even on literacy as a way of protecting children um, and actually have a more effective um, effective access to um, more healthy relationship with social media um, from children and from youth. Insightful, thank you very much. Yes, um, so first about the comic contract, I mean, um, I have I, I I came across one research on it once. Um, I just glanced through, but now that you've mentioned it, it's something that is worth looking into. 
And then with the second one, um, of course, it's true, like you're saying, it's an imbalanced relationship and we're putting a lot of pressure on the parents and then their children as well. I, I, I think it comes down to what also an institution describes as age-appropriate content. We know um, recently Ghana has been in, in, in the news with regards to um, the proper family bill. Uh, and then, uh, so, for example, you have children in other countries that can be freely taught certain things, but in Ghana, it will not be allowed. So how does an institution make sure? Because then it also comes with cost. Um, let's make this analogy. Assuming the Ghana government says, okay, YouTube. So YouTube Ghana, you need to put an extra filter because we don't want X amount of content. And that filter costs YouTube $1 million annually. And now, how does that translate into them making their money? So then that also means that Ghanaian content creators will get a lot less money than their counterparts in other countries who are not using um, uh, that filter. Because that is only directed to YouTube Ghana. So it's, it's, it's a conversation that has to be started. And a lot of things has to, like you were saying, it's very complex. We need to look at a lot of dimensions. And someone rightly said in, 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 the, uh, in the comment section in the online chat that um, if it's about minimizing um, uh, profits for the institutions or for the private companies, then they are definitely not going to do it. So we need to find a way uh, where they generate their money and still be able to make those age-appropriate decisions country specific, culture specific, because for example, another thing that, uh, and please um, don't worry if it's offensive to you, but in Ghana, uh, people eat cats. <laughs> yes, it's a delicacy. But in other places, I mean, we, we regard them as pets. They are pets, yes, but we, we still eat them. It's a delicacy, right? But in other places, it's just strictly pets. So what if I'm killing my cat, and then I post, oh, I'm making cash to you on Facebook. And Facebook flags it as a, uh, um, um, a, a, a very insensitive content. But in Ghana, it is not insensitive, right? And something that Facebook would allow, it becomes sensitive in Ghana. So it's, it's very complex. And as the discussion moves forward, we need to get a lot more people in to see where we can tolerate ourselves up to where we put their boundaries and then okay when it gets beyond this point it becomes a country specific issues and then country specific laws are made to address that but when it goes beyond point x that becomes a global issues a global issue and that the global law laws can also deal with that Okay, um, just to follow on, on the messaging apps part, uh, without going so specifically in content regulation, for example, uh, we would like to address about the exchange of the messaging apps. And uh, well, one question for, for the panelists is, are the quantum computing achievements uh, a threat for the messaging apps? We could start with Joao. Um, uh, well, the quantum computing uh, paradigm will, uh, when applied to comp to uh, like the modern computing, uh, we see that it will uh, totally affect because well, the most of the uh, algorithm programs, uh, the most uh, cryptography algorithms that we used in our messaging apps are based in protocols that rely on certain uh, assumptions related to how computes work nowadays and applying uh, like the computing uh, the quantum computing paradigm what we will see is a uh, is that most of these uh, protocols are broken because the, when we 
use quantum computers, this will be uh, much simpler to execute, much simpler to break. And the and well, uh, cryptography tries to be like uh, at least 30 years ahead. And when we see like a break in in the uh, computational power or to execute certain uh, certain uh, actions, certain uh, steps, we w we see that it will really affect what we have uh, now and what we collected, because all these information that were produced uh, in the past will be broken easily in the future. Uh, le let me aggregate a little of that, because I am moderator, but I will put my point of view on this, uh, because there is an issue that if you have a man in the middle in your home or in your neighborhood that is uh, listening, uh, like fishing, uh, listening to the to the communications without uh, within your mobile phone and your router, for example, if you share the Wi-Fi connection with with your friend, they will have access to the encrypted messages that are being transmitted uh, to your router, so then to upload it, for example. But if you collect, if this man in the middle or or a thief collect the data that nowadays you are transmitting, and then in five years when the quantum computers are globally available and publicly available in clouds, for example, uh, they can they can they will they will decrypt all your data. So all the data that we are uh, transmitting nowadays that is sensitive data like credit cards with your family, the password of Netflix, uh, all, all the things you are using right now uh, if there is a man in the middle at the ISP level at your home or in your neighborhood, in five years, everyone, this information will be public for everyone. So I, I think this is a, a very interesting issue that uh, is not easy to address. Uh, maybe a, a solution that, that I think could be to do very quantum resistant algorithms in, in the data messaging apps uh, that are not uh, right away. Uh, right now, we know that some of, of the algorithms that, that this application uses are not public enough, but from, from some researchers that, that I have heard and, and read, they say that, well, that there are no quantum resistance. So we are in a, in a very, very specific uh, problem right now because, as I said, all our data that we think is private, we, we think is sensitive, we share, uh, I don't know, private things with our uh, colleagues or, or friends, these things will be public someday if if it's someone nowadays collecting those because nowadays for example a, a common algorithm for a cream, for encryption that is classical encryption uh, a classical computer will spend years in decrypting one message but when we have one quantum computers this will be a, a, a matter of seconds to decrypt a full video so i think it's a very concerning uh, well, what do you think, Savio, about these quantum computing issues? I'm a bit pessimistic about that, but not in terms of the encryption, but about uh, the, the quantum computers, how popular are they getting. But, well, this is still an issue. And, well, uh, still in terms of, of, cyber, uh, of uh, message apps, I think that this is the smaller problems uh, in terms of decrypting data with classical uh, cryptography al algorithms. All the other, uh, most of the internet protocols rely on the classical computing uh, algorithms. So we, we, we will need to update our HTTPS, uh, DNSSEC, RPKI, all the protocols where uh, in which we, we are relying on today. But this is gonna take a big time. Uh, let's let's see the example of IPv6. So that, for example, we have 20 years to change all that. But well, and going out of this uh, chaotic scenario, uh, the point is that uh, we still have just a just a few uh, quantum resistant uh, cryptography algorithms, uh, and they are still not being wi uh, widely used. Uh, from the uh, in the specific terms of the messaging apps, uh, 
I don't I, I don't think it's hard to in some time uh change the the adapt the new quantum resistant uh, quantum resistant algorithms uh to uh, adapt them in, in the uh crypto cryptographic schemes okay i think it's working. so i think it's not going to take a long time as we have uh uh, uh, quantum resistant algorithms that we can uh, be confident that they, they are going to work well uh, to do not happen things that for example we had uh, with uh, some other hashing or or or, or crypt common crypto cryptography al algorithms that can be e easily breakable with some assumptions or something else so this is always the battle of of uh, cryptography so we are still getting uh, taking some time to have also uh quantum resistant uh cryptography algorithms where we can trust and but when we we have them uh, i think that it's it's going to be easy to change mostly in the 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 message apps but also the protocols can be a a threat uh, for other problems, not exactly for privacy, but for o other situations. Yes, and you remember earlier I said um, the whole process of our communication is changing. And of course, in, in every system, if there is a new system coming, then there is the need for the different players of the old system to adapt. And sometimes in adapting, you need to identify even new players that were formerly not part of the old system and see if you can together with them create the, the new system. And this is essential. As especially at a time where we're saying uh, leave no one behind and nothing for us without us. So then, of course, um, looking at the history of the Internet, how it has progressed and how we're seeing how the Internet was used for education and productivity in, in, in the West and in, in all the developing countries. But when it began to uh, uh, get to the global south, it became more of distractions and entertainment. And today in Ghana, more than 95% of Ghanaians who are hooked on the internet spend an average of five hours on social media, right? And, and this is something that uh, we're trying to change because just 2% of Ghanaians on the internet use it for productivity. And it is something that we are trying to change. So if co uh, quantum computing is now also invariably coming to change how um, uh, data is uh, stored and how data is assessed, then obviously there is the need to create that kind of inclusive ecosystem that has to do with policy regulation and Im implementation and enforcement to make sure that there is no country that is left behind. We do not want another situation where uh, a, a developed country has all the resources to fight these things in the age of quantum computers and have to sell it at an exorbitant price uh, 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 to the global south countries, uh, taking off our natural resources and other things. Of course, that is not what sustainable development is about. And for one, I am happy that we're having this conversation now uh, so that it's going to grow more inclusive and deep, deeper as uh, technology progresses. Thank you very much, our able panelists. And I would like to take more questions from the audience. As already indicated, it's a debate style, and we would like to hear more from you. Uh, so this is a question. I think it has been answered earlier, but I'll still um, take your next I am Oxno. I'm from Haiti. My question is about the deletion of images, photos on the social media. I'm always told that when a photo is deleted on the social media, Facebook, for example, it is not definitely deleted. I would like to know if in any case we can delete it definitely, please. If yes, what is the process? Okay, so we will come to that, an issue of data extractivism and all that. So um, I'll come to our audience. If you have any inputs, comments, please do share.
I am Dr. Sawalacho from here, Ethiopia. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for giving this chance, and this is a awesome session, I think. Uh, <clears throat> I am a vulnerability researcher, and uh, I want to ask the Ghanaian panelist uh, uh, the, if he forward a filtering mechanism. Uh, they have filtering mechanism for age group and uh, especially uh, the use for YouTube and other uh, <coughs> social media. Yeah, if he forward and uh, then I want to talk about the quantum also. Uh, there is, sorry, okay. Uh, and the other thing, there is a safe, qu quantum safe algorithms, especially in national uh, Institute of Standard and the Technology suggest uh, actually uh, it is not reality, but uh, they are trying to use some algorithms to protect even this uh, uh, to to tie the uh, encryption uh, encryption mechanism, and also we can use salting and other things. Uh, if uh, if we get attack or treat man in the middle attack, they get that encrypted data and uh, put that uh, data to this uh, quantum computer to decrypt. But they can get decrypted part. We, if they don't award the salting part, they can't use that data. So by using some salting mechanism and other things we can protect. And uh, the other thing also, uh, it is even for African and other third world country, it is not available, the quantum c even computer. So it is, it is not a big issue currently, but uh, uh, we can focus it for other parts. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you too. So we take the next round question. You, anyone? Okay, your name. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is um, Ushuke from Nigeria, uh, program manager and data um, analyst. I just want to uh, make a comment concerning the question that was asked from uh, my friend in uh, IT concerning the deletion of data on Facebook and the rest. So one thing that I, I know most of us would understand here, yeah, but most people outside will not understand is that when it comes to things about data privacy, it's almost like a wheel. Uh, no matter how you try to pull out different issues, in some way they are connected. So when it comes to the specific issue of um, your images being deleted on Facebook, for example, most um, social media uh, messaging apps, uh, basically their major defense is, oh, you consented to this. But then it is imperative that we get uh, these social media apps to give us the full picture of how our data gets processed. And I think many of the big techs are trying to do that now, albeit through pressure from groups like the IGF and uh, national groups and civil societies. But then it's imperative that we continue to get them to show us exactly how this uh, um, data is being processed, how it's being deleted, uh, everything transparently in structured manner. And that way uh, we can improve the trust that people have in these social uh, messaging uh, apps. It's very important to know that these uh, social messaging apps are very, very essential to the way we live our lives now. And trying to uh, overpry by bringing out everything as negative or everything as being in a way that uh, we do not understand might actually be of negative effect to users. So it's just important that as civil societies, as government, as groups like the IGF and ITU, we get these people to be as transparent as possible, follow the necessary data privacy acts or laws. Uh, for example, in Nigeria, uh, we have the NDPR, and then we're also working on the Child Online uh, Protection Act at this time, and then we try our best to ensure that every social media um, uh, provider in Nigeria tells us exactly how our data has been processed, how it's been deleted, the whole life cycle of the data, and that has to be transparent. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with him. And I have always questioned the transparency from big tech. And also, in one sense, I also ask myself, are we over-regulating these people? 
So I'll come to that. Any more questions before that? I think my man from Ethiopia asked about the, uh, the, the question about filtering mechanism and that of the quantum computer. So any of our panelists will take it. Then okay. Take so um, for the filtering mechanism, Ghana has not. Um, what the, 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 uh, I only made an assumption that assuming it comes to that point and the institution has to bear the cost, then definitely they'll pass the cost down to those who are making money off of YouTube, the Ghanaians. And, and that also would then mean that those Ghanaian content creators will then have less money. So uh, when, where does the, the government of Ghana even start that conversation, seeing those who it's going to affect? And of course, if there are less and less Ghanaian YouTube uh, content creators, then uh, what that means is that the story of Ghanaians are no longer being told. And then you have less and less contact on Ghana. Then definitely uh, what we are actually saying that uh, we don't have a lot more stories of Africans on the internet is what would happen. So uh, when it comes to that, then you see the different players. Just by having this discussion, we can map out the different stakeholders when it comes to having a filter mechanism and then involve them in the policy discussions, uh, 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 co-create a policy that will both uphold the values of the Ghanaian and still make uh, uh, it possible for Ghanaian content creators to push Ghanaian stories out there. So that was just an assumption. But if it will have to happen, these are some of the things we need to look at. So we, we have 20 minutes to go. Uh, we heard a lot about accountability, also education, different things uh, about improving the, the algorithms uh, from the company side. And now I, I will share my screen to to you to to be able to participate in a in a Mentimeter. Mentimeter is a platform you you will see instantly. Let me. As he shares the Mentimeter form, um, if anyone has a side question or comment to anything, okay, you have to say something. Okay. I would like just to add uh, a little thing about the deletion, uh, the deletion of data in the in all the, in the apps. So basically, the the current uh, data protection laws uh, require that if the user Ask to delete the, uh, its data. It should be deleted. The problem is that how can I say if that the, that data is was really deleted or not? So this is one point on, on accountability. But more specifically, in the case of WhatsApp and and Telegram, uh, in WhatsApp your media keeps uh, stored in the server encrypted, but uh, stored in the server for. 30 days, and in Telegram, uh, it, it keeps stored until you delete it. All, all the parts of the communication uh, delete that that media, uh, except uh, in the case of secret uh, chats, where one of the parts of the of the chat in, in case of Telegram, if someone de delete the, the same data, will will be deleted in the other side. If and if I'm not. Uh, with a bad, bad memory, in the case of secret chat, no, uh, it, the data of secret chats are stored in the cloud servers, but this the secret key, uh, key of the uh, of decryption of that media, it's only to the parts of, of the communication in the case of secret chat. So I think the the participants on Zoom can see the the link to the mentee. But you can, from the audience here, access your mobile phone. You can go to menti.com and put the code. Ah, OK. Now it's in the screen. Ah, but we have the, the translation. So you need to go to menti.com and put the code that is 58541704. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's on the top <laughs> of the screen.
So there is a question for for all the audience, for the online and the of, of uh, and the on site, about what are the current challenges uh, to face regarding secure exchange of, of the messages. So to have more input. Okay, so as the moderator said, uh, we want to know the current challenges you are facing with regard to uh, secure exchanges of messages from your region. So you just go to www.menti.com, menti spelled M E N T I dot com, and use the code 58541704. I repeat again www.menti.com menti is spelled m-e-n-t-i dot com and use the code 58541704 and we have the, some of the questions here that are, what are the current challenges to face regarding to secure exchange of messages is it transparency of messaging uh, transparency of messaging provides we need to have strong privacy policy and terms and conditions Is it confidentiality of communication? We would like to have this survey from you. Just want to say that the original idea is to maintain a debate while the messages are coming, so we can have this part more uh, collaborative. Uh, some comments that, that are appearing there, store data managing, transparency, trustworthiness, they need to have strong DNS and IP. So very, very good comments approaching. And if one of the panelists want to comment on, on some of the things that are showing up in, in the Metimeter. Yes, thank you all very much. And remember that, well, this is totally connected to the Global Digital Compact and some of the key points of the roadmap, for example, about trust and security and ensuring digital human rights. So thank you so much for being with us and thank you for all your inputs. Sorry, I was on the board. Uh, I'd like to thank our online audience, and it's been a very insightful conversation. As I already indicated, let's keep the conversation going. And at IGF, uh, we need to have an open, secured internet. We need to have our data protected and use effectively, use our technology effectively. And thank you, everyone over here. Thank you so much for your time. Have a very pleasant day. Bye.